Hi, my name is Rama Akiraju. I'm an IBM Fellow and CTO for AI Ops at IBM. Today, I want to talk about the opportunity for AI in optimizing IT operations. The vision of self-healing, self-monitoring, and uh, self-managing IT systems, which was primarily the vision of autonomic computing, was not realizable to the extent that we had wanted to up until now, primarily because we didn't have all of the, the main ingredients that we need to make that happen, which include the kind of compute, which include the advanced algorithms to process natural language data or structured and semi-structured and unstructured data. So while some progress has been made on this front, I would say a lot was left on the table, but thanks to the advancements in in cloud computing, in AI, and in uh, machine learning specifically, and the recent advancements in natural language processing now make it possible for us to really put AI to use to optimize IT operations. So today I wanna talk about what that opportunity is and what we are doing at IBM, and in general for the industry and the community, what, the, what, what they can do and what the opportunity is. So if you look at, uh, site reliability engineers or IT operations administrators, who are the main persona or people who are responsible for managing these IT applications to keep them up and running, highly available, reliable, and um, um, highly scalable and such in, in production environments. Oh, I don't know why it's going back. In production environments, uh, we see that they are constantly playing catch up psycho game. That is a problem occurs in production and they are woken up at 3 a.m. in the morning and they have to go you know, looking for where the problem has been, debug it, diagnose it, quickly apply some resolution action and, uh, and then figure out what the actual root cause of the problem is and send it over to the development team or you know, they themselves have to get to it. But before they can get to it and address some of the root causes, another production problem happens and they are on it again. The same cycle repeats. So they, we have to help the IT operations administrators and the CIOs break out of this cycle to, to get from reactive incident management to predictive and proactive so that we can help avoid these issues from happening in the first place. But of course, whenever there is a, a problem, your house is on fire, you need to be able to put it out first, right? It doesn't help to go you know, try to build a swimming pool at that time. So we need to still provide enough automation and capabilities to site reliability engineers to address the problem at hand when a, in real time when a production problem occurs and still be able to help them predict and avoid them in the future. So we see the opportunity for AI ops is to, to really infuse AI throughout these cycles of reactive, you could also say real time, predictive and proactive. In each one of these phases, we can envision opportunities for AI where AI may start out by being an assistant, a guide, a helper to a human, and the human is actively driving the main decision-making and such all the way to the system, taking the lead and automating as much of it as, as, uh, as it can while keeping human in the loop. So our vision is for the self-healing, self-managed, self um, uh, he, um, monitoring applications, right? That vision of autonomic computing, we really want to build enough automation so that the systems are capable of doing that, but it's going to be a journey. So to motivate, I want to first present this, this example where let's say in an environment, in an IT operations environment, all kinds of things are happening at any given point in time. And if you have, let's say, some kind of application performance monitoring type of application installed, you're constantly monitoring the health of your applications by looking at the metrics, by looking at um, the application logs and whatnot. So typically in an environment, um, in any number of things could be happening. Some um, Your memory consumption could suddenly go down because there is a garbage uh, um, cleaning, um, you know, uh, activity that just happened, you know, garbage collection one, or that uh, uh, a particular shopping application, a shopping cart is not accessible um, and the system is down. So you're getting all these types of events. Some are actionable, 
and some require action, some are some don't require action. For example, the garbage collection, because of which memory, sudden memory, you know, uh, usage drop, doesn't really require an action. So it's an event that can go into a, into a log, but you don't have to wake up an IT operations administrator at 3, 3 a.m. in the morning for that. Whereas if uh, you know the shopping cart of a particular retail application is down, you do want to notify the person. But then, you know, just mentioning that you know a shopping cart application is down in itself is not useful. You want to collect more information. You know, maybe it actually went down because the server caught fire. Why did the server catch fire? Maybe because um, the fan was not working, and so. Individually, all of these systems, if you're monitoring them, they may be sending alerts, um, say fan failure or that server failure or this particular shopping cart failure. Now the question is, do you send all of these different kinds of alerts events to the user and bother the user, let them figure out whether they're all related to the same incident that is happening at that point in time or can we do better? Right, there is an opportunity for AI where it can correlate all of these alerts based on the signatures in them, which could be mentions of the IP addresses, mentions of the particular server service component. And if you have access to the application topology, it could be about how they are all related to one another. And therefore, you correlate them and say, okay, alert A, B, and C came, but they're all related to one another based on the topological relationship. And now I see that together, you know, all of these alerts really are a group and they need to be promoted as an incident to be notified uh, uh, because, you know, the actual business application that touches the, the end customers is getting affected because of it. Like in this particular case, it's the customer's um, application and the, the, the shopping cart is not accessible. Okay, so you create an incident ticket at that point and, you know, notify the IT operations administrator. But then is that it? You know, what are they going to do? How should they bring it up immediately? So maybe, you know, the system can even provide a recommendation and we'll get to how it can provide those recommendations in just a bit. But if it can even provide a recommendation and say, well, you know, this application uh, has shopping cart is down immediately forward this, this set of requests coming to the redundant server, okay? So that will fix the problem. That's a quick repair. But really, the, to address the root cause, what you have to do, you should procure a new server and um, uh, ensure that the new server is set up properly and then divert traffic accordingly again. So that would be the long-term resolution. So the system is able to provide that resolution and not just stop there, but go ahead and automatically run the scripts, corresponding scripts or runbooks as they may call them, to reroute the shopping cart application to the redundant server and to automatically create a, a provisioning request for a new server. How about that? So that is taking action proactively and helping an IT operations administrator and freeing up their time from addressing these problems. So that's the kind of examples that we are talking about. So what exactly, what are the metrics that we are trying to improve as part of this IT operations management? We are talking about reducing the mean time it takes to diagnose an incident, detect, isolate, fix them, and verify that the problem is not repeating. So the mean times that are measured for each one of these things, if we are able to reduce it, that eventually boils up to you, the, the particular company who is doing the monitoring and using AI ops application would be able to better serve their customers with high availability, high reliability, and as a result, they're able to honor or even exceed the service level agreements and objectives that they, they are setting for themselves. So that is the goal. But better still, what we want to be able to do is not just do the reactive, not stop there, but be able to really get to the source of the problem and proactively avoid it from happening. So one of the things that the opportunities that we see here is why uh, is the following? Why do problems occur in production? Typically, problems occur in production because of some changes that are made, um, either to the application um, or that the software development process has gone through certain changes in terms of new feature getting added, new 
capability or bug be, uh, being um, uh, addressed and that change now got deployed. So if you look at the software development process, right, from build to um, from design to to code test build code build test um, then deploy the applications and finally monitor them if all we are doing is with application performance monitoring type of systems monitoring the health of applications the best that you can do is when health is going bad you can you know you and, and certain metrics are going haywire you can do incident management. But if you want your, you know, you don't even want those metrics to be going haywire in the first place. The best way to do it is to catch problems before they occur. You know, the, the analogy that I often like to give is uh, exactly like human health, right? If you want to avoid, um, it, you know, some of these lifestyle type of problems like blood pressure or the diabetes and those sort of things, you really want to have good you know, eating habits, good sleeping habits, good exercise habits, and that's the best way to prevent and proactively avoid those problems. Uh, the, the idea here is the same. So you get into the software development life cycle and examine each of the artifacts as and when they're getting produced, such as um, the build, the code changes, the test coverage, and the, the deployment um, changes that are coming in, the pull requests, the change requests, and so on, and be able to, if, you, if you're able to proactively predict the risk associated with those and say, hey, this particular change that you have made at this point in time is a highly risky one because in the past, similar type of incidents have resulted, similar type of changes have resulted in incidents in production, and here is a specific place where you may want to make a change in order to really improve the quality of this change so that the likelihood of this causing any problem in production is low. How cool would that be? So that is the, the, the nirvana we want to get to with proactive issue avoidance. So the idea is that at every step of the way in the software development life cycle, you put in checks and gates. So the gates are the risk predictions and you say, you know, institute a workflow process where if the risk is higher than a certain threshold, don't even promote that activity to production. So, what are, if you look at both reactive, predictive, and proactive, what are the various analytics that we can do? So in the motivating example I, I had shown, um, a set of steps that are happening, that is somebody is set observing and generating those events, the events being the shopping cart is down or that um, sudden memory usage has dropped. So that's about observing the metrics, but from them, from, from those metrics to gener being able to generate alerts, you need some kind of an anomaly prediction. So the opportunity here is, you know, first you can think of observing, observing metrics, logs um, from the production environment and being able to do anomaly detection from them. Then, you know, grouping that, you know, when a server failure, uh, a fan failure and a sh shopping cart failure is coming and you, you, I had shown in the example how they need to be grouped because you don't want to bother and IT operations administrator with each one of them individually, but really tell a, a coherent story that this incident is happening and, and multiple alerts are getting raised because of it, because multiple systems are that are dependent on it, and then whichever is the root cause of the issue, are all raising alerts too, right? So that is grouping them all to reduce noise, event grouping. And there is a lot of opportunity for different analytics in doing that. But let us let me first go through it. And then given the amount of short amount of time, I'll very briefly touch upon what are the AI aspects of it. Event grouping, then identifying where the actual cause might be, what might have caused the probable cause in, in, in the chart that I had shown earlier. You know, the probable cause in, in, in the particular case is actually the fan failure. The fan failure is the root cause for the problem. Because the fan failed, server caught fire. Because the server caught fire, um, the shopping cart application that's running on it went down, right? Uh, so being able to identify that, what exactly caused the fault is very important. And you know there is a lot that can be done there with regards to capturing the, the topology of the applications and really figuring out based on the relationships and the directionality of the relationships, what might have caused the problem in the first place. Then understanding the impact. I'm talking about the first column right now in the reactive. I covered log and metric anomaly detection, event grouping, fault localization. Then blast radius. What are all the components that are getting affected as a result of it? 
And uh, so once you do all of the diagnosis, then it's about, okay, how do I solve the problem? Again, in the example that I had given, I said, well, the recommendation is to reroute um, this particular shopping cart requests to the redundant server. How would the system automatically come up with such a request if it hadn't uh, either been manually, you know, a mapping for each type of a problem has already been created and you're doing a lookup, or that you have a knowledge of the previous incident tickets and the actions that were taken as part of those previous incident tickets, and you are able to now match the symptoms of the, the problem with what the known set of issues in the incident ticket, prior incident ticket records, and extract the actions that were taking, taken and provide that as a recommendation, right? That would be, for some things, maybe you would have a simple mapping, but for many things, you may not. Um, in such case, really doing that map mapping is really important. Again, here I go back to the analogy of health because um, um, that's really very appropriate here. Um, if you go to a doctor's office, you know, a doctor listens to your um, different symptoms, you know, say you have runny nose, you have cough, you have fever, you have chills. The doctor maps it to a known problem that um, he has uh, cured for other patients and immediately says okay well if it's flu just you know take rest if it is a bacterial you know prescribe this particular uh, antibiotics um, you know right uh, how does the doctor come up with it because the doctor has done it enough times and knows and in here for an IT operations administrator because we are trying to free up his time while a human may be able to do it but not every uh, individual at different levels of skill sets may be able to immediately come up with a resolution. So we want to really be that brain uh, which is able to capture that knowledge and is able to quickly retrieve from within that knowledge base as to what might be the relevant recommendation here and um, you know provide the next best action recommendation. Now in the predictive analytics, it's about law of metric prediction. You know, before a particular you know metric is going down, you see the trend of it and say, hey, here is you know this you know memory usage is steadily going up. It's not yet um, above the threshold, therefore no alert is getting raised yet. But I'm seeing it, the pattern is consistent and it's growing and it's going to very quickly reach its limits. And before that bad thing happen, why don't you happens? Why don't you yourself? actively take action, you know, predict it, right? So that's the prediction part of it. You can predict the severity of an incident that might occur as a result of it ahead of time um, and um, predict what might be the root cause for it and so on, right? So there are a bunch of things that you can do in the predictive category. Proactive one is where I talked about where you really look at the software development lifecycle, shift left in the dev ops lifecycle, if you will, and um, uh, predict the risk associated with deployment changes, with test coverage, but based on that, um, the test quality and the build um, and uh, the code uh, changes and the vulnerabilities and, and catch those problems early on so that you can avoid those issues from happening. So there are different kinds of analytics that are possible. So if you put it all together into a system, this is how it may look like. You know, you're constantly observing in real time, logs, tickets, metrics, topology, and those sort of things. And in the software development lifecycle, you are looking at the Git issues, um, the pull requests and the deployment requests, change requests, and those sort of things. Um, but you have a bunch of anomaly predictors, detectors that are running. And as they are getting, uh, as they're generating alerts, events, event groups are being formed, our alert grouping is getting done, and the actual problem is being identified, isolated, and the diagnosis is being done. Then on the right hand side, most part of it, where you'll see you tap into your prior knowledge and get the similar incidents and um, uh, predict and actually suggest uh, or better yet uh, run those automations so that you can resolve the problems. And in the pro predictive and proactive cases, you do change risk prediction types of algorithms. Now, what might be the algorithms that uh, we implement? I know um, I won't be able to cover them in depth, but I will just mention them. Uh, for anomaly prediction and detection, depending on the type of data, if it is metrics, you can do a lot of time series algorithms. If it is logs, logs are unstructured data. Therefore, you have to really do quite a bit of uh, feature, uh, feature preparation, that is process the logs uh, by parsing them. And log parsing is a, is a very interesting problem in itself where you have to deal with um, different kinds of enti extracting entities like date times and host names and uh, you know all kinds of um, 
strange formats that the data may come in and really be able to extract features. And you can convert those tokenized features into word embeddings to convert them into more structured features, which you can then process through different kinds of time series algorithms and such. So we've, um, um, exp we've been, I would say, successful at doing that with logs um, in uh, doing the anomaly prediction from logs. Then for event grouping and entity linking and correlation and such, you can em employ techniques such as uh, uh, temporal grouping, spatial grouping, association rule mining and such. And for fault localization and blast radius, you can look at uh, graph traversal um, uh, and um, you know graph theory based algorithms to better understand the directionality and what might have caused the problem. And for incident similarity, you can map it to information retrieval problem where you are looking at prior tickets incidents from the prior ticket incident record database and matching the symptoms and doing a lot of natural language processing to extract summary phrases that might be indicative of the actions. So you really have to look at action and entity phrase extraction and sequencing them likely to create um, a sequence of actions. So there is a lot of NLP, time series algorithms, machine learning algorithms that uh, um, we can bring to bear to address this problem. Um, and not to forget the user involvement in all of this. Don't, let's not for, uh, assume that uh, even for a minute that the system can fully automate everything. We're not there yet. Users play a critical role in the whole process, um, keeping human in the loop to give feedback to the system at various points in the predictions that the system is making and the recommendations the system is making and uh, taking that feedback, incorporating that back into the system and continuously learning and improving the systems is critical to this building successful, real, useful real world applications. Um, and finally, I would conclude by saying that, um, you know, as with any AI infused application, there are going to be, um, there's, it's going to be a journey. There are going to be issues related to uh, bringing people up to speed, uh, challenges in data preparation, address, addressing the time to value, um, how much time does it take to train the models? How much data do you need versus can you do something quickly? Um, how much infrastructure do you need to train these models and what skills do people need to really manage these and maintain these models? These are all non-trivial considerations that have to be paid careful attention to. They're not specific to AI ops alone. They're specific to any AI application that's being built in production and being deployed. But uh, it, that would apply just the same to AI ops as well. So I would conclude by saying that um, that there is a tremendous opportunity for AI to significantly optimize and transform IT operations management. And I hope I have given a quick view into what those areas are. Namely, I talked about reactive, predictive, and proactive um, uh, phases in doing IT operations management to get to that final vision of achieving autonomic computing where you have self-managing, self-healing, self-monitoring applications. Thank you.